Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, February 6th. Today's topic is small talk about small tech. Our special guest is Sydney Sharon. Your show hosts are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffat and Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. And I think I'm turning the mic over to Peggy to introduce Sydney today after I do the poll questions. First poll question is, what is your role in education? One, A, choice, classroom teacher K to 12, and then type your grade level in chat. B, librarian. C, technology specialist coordinator. D, college university instructor, or E, other. And you vote with that letter A up near your name near the top. And if you do vote E, type in the chat. I'll give you a chance to vote and then publish this to the whiteboard. Most who answered the question said classroom teacher, K to 12. The next highest was other. The next question, I have to switch the question type. Number two, have you used Google Cardboard or any other virtual reality tools? Again, I will publish those. 38% said no, they haven't, and 26% said yes. Our last question, have you used Pocket to save favorite web resources for later viewing? And again, I will post those to the whiteboard. 48% said no. Only 18% who voted said yes. Again, introducing our topic for today, small talk about small tech. And our special guest, Sydney Sharon, your show hosts are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffat. And Tammy Moore, thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. Now I'll turn the mic over to, Sid or to Peggy to introduce Sydney, who will then ask the newbie question. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lori. <coughs> well, we are thrilled to welcome back Sydney Sharon to Classroom 2 Live today. Sydney presented for us last year, and she shared her student technology conference keynote that was all about creating videos in the classroom. So if you didn't get a chance to see that, you should search in our archives for that recording and take a look at it. One of the awesome benefits of attending virtual conferences like the Student Technology Conference is that I get to see some amazing, inspiring presentations. And I'm always scouting to find the best to bring back and share with all of you. Sydney definitely fits that category. As a high school student, she continues to explore, use, and create all kinds of tech tools that not only support her learning, but that she constantly shares with other students and teachers, both in her school and nationally. I know you're going to love hearing her insights into the tech tools that she plans to share with us today. And I also know you'll become a fan of Sydney, just as I have. Sydney is a 10th grade student, and she is currently the sophomore class president at West Hampton Beach High School. She created and she continues to supervise and edit the middle school's newsletter. And her interest in technology led her to be a keynote speaker at the Student Tech Conference and also at the Suffolk um, Asset Conference in front of 800 teachers and educators last year. So thrilling to see what high school students are doing. Her passion for filmmaking has led her to screen one of her movies at a local movie theater. And also, she attended the New York Film Academy for two summers. This past summer, she attended a program on leadership and global engagement at the Leadership Institute at Brown University. 
she is definitely inspired to teach others why technology is helpful and how they can easily use it to learn in a quick, easy, fun way. So, Sydney, I'd like to have you answer this newbie question for us because I know that you have a lot of opinions about this. Why is it important for teachers to provide students opportunities to use technology in their classes? Thank you for the kind introduction, Peggy. So to answer your question, we live in a world now where technology is becoming incredibly advanced and is being integrated with everything. So as students, we spend the majority of the day in school. So for us to gain the exposure to these new devices, they need to be presented to us in the classroom. Hi everyone, again my name is Sydney Sharon and welcome to Small Talk about Small Tech. I'm a 15 year old sophomore from West Hampton Beach High School and Apple Distinguished School. Today we are going to sit down, relax, grab a cup of tea and have a nice conversation about some great tech products and how you can use them in the classroom. As a student and someone who loves technology, I'm always looking for new things to use in the classroom or at home. In my search for the best tech, a few items really stood out to me and inspired me to create this presentation. Without further ado, the small tech that we will be discussing today are Google Cardboard, the Wacom Intuos tablet, the app, Pocket, and 3D printers. Let's start with Google Cardboard. Google does not sell their own device but they have designed it for other companies to adopt. I recommend the one from IM Cardboard, which you can purchase from Amazon.com for about $25. We are now going to enter a web tour to show a quick video that I made to introduce the Google Cardboard. If the video does not start automatically, please click the play button. I will also be posting the link into the chat. In the race to make the best virtual reality headsets for consumers and gamers, Google released their Google Cardboard, a simply designed headset for people looking to experience virtual reality without breaking the bank and for students who want to learn through interactivity. As stated by Armand Valdez from Mashable, virtual reality is a fully immersive, computer simulated environment that gives a user the feeling of being in that environment instead of the one they're actually in. Simply put, virtual reality is exactly what it sounds like. A digital world that can be encountered with the use of new technology like the, like the Google Cardboard VR headset. A surrounding image or video with depth is created by using the brain's innate viewing processes. Both of our eyes see essentially two different images, the same scene from different angles. What we see is due to the brain accounting for the differences between the images and forming a three-dimensional view with depth. This is called stereoscopics. Companies like Google utilize this science to create the VR headsets by showing two images of the same scene from different angles through lenses. Google Cardboard takes a simple and affordable approach to virtual reality with their headset designed, as the name says, with cardboard and by placing your phone into the cardboard as a viewing screen. With Google Cardboard in the classroom, students can learn practically anything with applications created by companies such as Verse, Discovery Education, and Google. Verse is an application dedicated to storytelling in virtual reality. Partnering with the New York Times Magazine for some of their videos, 
first shows short films that you see in 360 degrees by spinning around with the headset on. And because that sounds dizzying, I recommend sitting in a chair that spins because the environment can be disorienting when standing, but not nearly as much when sitting. The videos featured on Verse revolve around current events. I watched a great one called The Displaced that was an engaging experience detailing the lives of three children from different areas of the world whose lives and homes were affected by war. The Discovery Education virtual reality app also shows immersive and somewhat interactive videos that tell you where to look as the story unfolds. Most of the Discovery videos are about the world in which we live. They have clips from Racing Extinction, Mythbusters, and Survivor Man as well. One of my favorites was a video called Hearing Colors about a girl with synesthesia a condition in which senses are associated with each other, like the color green being associated with the smell of bacon. As she plays her violin, she tells you where to look to see the colors that she associates with the notes. This was an especially interesting video because I watched it after having learned about synesthesia in my AP Psychology class. It definitely provided me with a better understanding of the condition. Google's Cardboard app is a must because it helps introduce the user to the world of virtual reality with tutorials and different features for the user to take a walk around the Eiffel Tower or look through the dinosaur exhibit at the Museum of Natural History. And if you enjoy walking around the, the Eiffel Tower in virtual reality, then the Google Street View app is for you. Some locations around the world have an option in which you can view them in virtual reality with the cardboard. This was helpful to me after learning about Toledo in Spanish class because I was able to put my virtual reality headset on and feel like I was in Toledo. I understood what the teacher was talking about with the landscape of the area because I felt like I was there. The next tech item that we will be discussing is the Wacom Intuos pen tablet. You can purchase this on Amazon starting at a price of $100. There are three different styles when you search this tablet. The difference between the art, comic, and photo boards are the free software that you can download with them. On the box, there is a key code that lets users unlock some applications for what you choose to do with the tablet. There is also a draw model of the Wacom Intuos, but it does not include multi-touch. So the art, comic, or photo is what I would recommend. Here is another video that I made to show using the Wacom Intuos. connects to the computer and allows the user to write and draw anything, anywhere, on the computer screen. With an easy learning curve, the Wacom Intuos is equipped with customizable shortcut buttons on both the tablet and the pen, and it has a touch-sensitive pen. When using the tablet, you can customize the button specifically for different applications. Teachers can print hundreds of worksheets a week for their classes to use. 
This is bad for the environment, the budget, and the student's backpack. By bringing the Wake Home Intros into the classroom, we will be saving paper, saving money, and saving students from shoulder pain. This tablet can easily connect to the computer and be used with any software. It can be used as a replacement for paper handouts because students can use it to write assignments on their computer. Students can also use the tablets for digitally taking handwritten notes. By doing this, we can lighten the load that students lug around in their backpacks and lessen the chance of losing papers. These tablets can be used in art classes with more advanced drawing programs as they are designed to help the professional artist. An online drawing program that I use all the time called Sumo Paint works great with the tablets and I would highly recommend it for anything from doodling and drawing on pictures to making diagrams for class. The Wake Home Intros can also be used to make tutorial videos for teachers, especially math and science. I was once asked to make a tutorial on solving polynomials for math class and found it difficult to use the mouse to write the equations on the screen. If I had a writing tablet, then I would have been able to make the tutorial much easier. I also have a teacher who used a Wacom tablet to make some of her science tutorials for the class. I've been using my Wacom Intuos for a while now, and it quickly became my favorite tech product because of its easy use and overall fun experience. We are now going to move on to discuss one of my favorite apps, Pocket. Pocket is essentially a save button for your web browser. Once you download the free app, make an account, and follow the on-screen instructions on how to enable the mobile sharing extension, you can, you can begin saving anything from articles to YouTube videos. Pocket works similar to adding websites to the reading list on Safari. However, with Pocket, the links that you are saving on your phone can be opened on your computer and vice versa. Although you can use iCloud to access the reading list, on all devices, iCloud cannot always be set up in a school setting. This is where Pocket is better because I can save something on my phone, then access it on a computer at school. And the computer doesn't even have to be my own. You can use a desktop at a library, and the link saved to your Pocket would still be there. Pocket is more than just an app, as it can be downloaded onto a computer and added to the toolbar as well. Let's say the class is working on a research project. As you are searching for different sources of information on the computer, a few articles really strike you as interesting and informative. How do you remember where your article was? Many people will leave tabs open or copy and paste the link into a document, but with Pocket, you can easily save the website to be open later. You can also tag the article to a folder that makes searching for things much easier. YouTube videos can also be saved right from the YouTube application, as well as apps from the App Store. Any application on your phone or tablet that allows for items to be sent, for example, in an email or message, will allow them to be saved to Pocket. Another fun feature of Pocket is that it provides recommended articles for active users. Articles and links can be viewed in the app or the website getpocket.com. Pocket is an app that I use almost every day. I have the app on my phone and my iPad, as well as on both my home and school computers. I'm constantly saving resources for school or just interesting things that I find on the internet. I even saved some of the articles that I obtained information from for this presentation onto my Pocket account. 3D printing is what many are saying is the future of technology and design, not the future of education. Rather, 3D printing is a great tool to use to teach students now. There are two different companies that I will be discussing today. The first is MakerBot, 
which is a more expensive printer ranging in price with the model you choose from over $1,000 to around $7,000. The other company is Micro 3D, which is a smaller printer that starts at a price of $350. These prices also don't include the cost of filaments, the material that is used for printing, which can cost between $15 and $20, depending on the type and color. This next video will show my micro 3D printer in action as a machine makes a Green Lantern superhero ring. As shown in the video, 3D printing works by heating up a filament that is then layered to form a design. Some of the most popular 3D printers come from the company called MakerBot. The MakerBot 3D printers can be used with a series of accessories, can be used with a series of accessories from the company as well such as a scanner that can take any existing object and scan it into a three-dimensional model for printing. MakerBot promotes their printer for everything, including education. They have a course booklet that helps teachers use 3D printing in their lesson plans. This booklet, however, is only completely accessible if you own a MakerBot product. The MakerBot 3D printers can be very expensive, so a more affordable option for a 3D printer is a micro 3D printer, which is the printer that I have at home and love. This printer is much smaller than the MakerBot, but is a great option to enter the world of 3D printing. You can make practically anything and choose the quality of your print. A great use of 3D printing in the classroom is making and printing models. The science teachers in my school make 3D models of proteins and bacteria for us to observe in the class. This is an image of the structure of graphite on the left and a carbon cylinder on the right. My brother has even made a trumpet mouthpiece to use in band class. With 3D printing, you can either design your own models or download them from the internet. One of my favorite sites for 3D designs is Thingiverse.com. Thingiverse has downloadable material ranging from models to toys and appliances. You can upload your own creations and rate things that other people have made. There are also instructions for items that you would need to assemble and recommended settings for printing. Thingiverse also has an educational feature. When you click Thingiversity under the Learn tab, it directs you to another page dedicated to connecting educators and providing educational material to print. Another website to use is MyMiniFactory.com. It is similar to Thingiverse and has an education category under the Explore tab. All of the products that I have discussed today are compatible with most programs, although I tend to use Apple applications. What I'm trying to convey with this presentation is that there's an entire world of technology applications available to us today. We might not understand all of them, and we might not be able to get our hands on all of them, but the, but the knowledge is out there, and all of it can be used to teach. We can use the Google Cardboard for the apps to teach about science and current events, or we can use it to teach about virtual reality itself. The same goes for 3D printing. It is our execution in how we utilize these products in the classroom that will inspire students. Not everyone sitting in a biology class is going to be a doctor. So by teaching with these different materials, teachers may be able to teach towards a student's interests in a more effective way. I was inspired when my teachers let me make movies for the class projects. 
It led me to develop a passion for filmmaking and technology that has impacted my life more than I could ever imagine it would. Honestly, if I had never been given that opportunity, I would not be sitting here giving this presentation to you today. Thank you all for joining me today. I hope that I have inspired you to bring some of these amazing new technology products into the classroom. I'd like to thank Peggy, Lori, Tammy, and the Classroom 2.0 group for inviting me to speak today. Thank you all again. And we have time to answer a few questions, if you'd like to type those into the comments. And this slide shows some extra links to resources for more information on the topics that I've discussed today. And the websites here are those that I've mentioned today. I did capture some questions. Uh, Cindy, is your school one-to-one, -one or what devices do you have available at school? Our school is one-to-one. -one. It is. So we, all of the students get uh, MacBook computers. Mm -hmm. So in the high school, we can bring those home. But in the, um, and in the middle school, you can bring those home as well. But in the elementary school, the students get laptops that they use in the classroom. And some classes have iPads as well. OK. The next one was answered. Uh, 3D printing can get very expensive. How do teachers manage? the cost of 3D printing in the classroom? So it can get very expensive buying the different filaments. Um, I know that some teachers at my school, they, uh, they just got new 3D printers the other day for the middle school and for the high school. So it's really, they work with the technology director at the school, and then they work on the school budget and try to get approved. And so far, they found that it's beneficial. So we started out with one 3D printer. Mm -hmm. We started out with one MakerBot. We have a scanner at the school. And we just got a bunch more printers for the building. OK. And the other question that I captured, uh, please share how do, how do teachers use this technology in their school? So with the with the um, the Google Cardboard, um, the teachers use that. My teacher, my Spanish teacher, actually used that. I brought it into the classroom, and the class mm -hmm. took a tour around Spain because she likes teaching us about areas in Spain all the time. And then Pocket, we use that for finding websites for our projects and presentations when we're getting ready to make a bibliography. We save everything, and then we put the bibliography together. Um, with the Wake Home tablet, the teachers often will use that to make tutorial videos. And the 3D printers, a lot of the science teachers in my building use that. And so they use that to make models for things like I showed in the picture earlier. And does your school use Google Classroom? Yes. It's an Apple-based Apple product, but you do use Google Classroom? Yeah, we use Google Classroom all the time. Um, some of my teachers post homework assignments on there. We take quizzes in gym class on Google Classroom. Uh, we do, all of my classes have Google Classroom set up. Mm -hmm. and what are some of your other favorite cardboard or virtual reality apps besides Discovery VR? The the other couple you shared? The ones that I discussed are really my favorite apps. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard to find apps for iPhone. Um, it's easier to find apps for Android, mm -hmm. but um, which is just something to keep in mind when you're working with the Google Cardboard. So the four mm -hmm. that I discussed today are definitely my favorite. Um, the, and the Google Street View, which mm -hmm. I've mentioned, that one's really great because you can, Google's working on new ways to record virtual reality right now. So with the Google Street View, you can upload your own videos to that, which is something interesting for that app. Is there any blended or online learning at your school? Uh, we, in our classes, we do a lot on the computers. Um, 
some of the teachers make videos. So we do most of our work on the computer. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anyone else have questions for Sydney? For your school projects, are you encouraged to create videos instead of paper reports? Definitely. All of my classes really uh, allow us to make videos. Mm -hmm. um, for AP World History, the teacher often has us make videos. So um, my YouTube is in the link, and we just made, I'm pretty sure the video is up there for a Viking video we made. Mm -hmm. So a few of my friends went around, we talked about Vikings in a funny way as a project. Mm -hmm. So we do things like that a lot in school. That's great. How has the use of technology by teachers in your classrooms changed over the years? The teachers have definitely become more accepting of the technology in the classrooms. So where in more in elementary school, we didn't use technology that often, mm -hmm. except in fourth grade was really when we got the MacBooks. Um, now as I'm moving into high school and uh, we're starting to use more technology, so like the 3D printers is something that we just got last year. So we've been using that more often and different products like that. Great. I think those are all the questions I was able to capture, unless somebody else has any other questions for Sydney. I hear a couple others. What program would you suggest for elementary students to begin with? For it depends on what you would be doing, what type of program are you talking about for elementary students? The person didn't say. Video program. For videos, I started out with iMovie in fourth grade. Um, and now I've moved on from iMovie to use more advanced programs. Mm -hmm. So I definitely recommend using iMovie. It's free if you have uh, MacBooks in your school. Mm -hmm. It's free program. That's what I discussed last year during my presentation mm -hmm. was iMovie. So I, I love iMovie, and it's definitely a great way to start out. Is there a program at your school to help parents learn about the tech you're using? There is not a program, but that would definitely be a great idea. And I think Sydney answered the question about the making videos. It was with iMovie. Uh, did a teacher introduce you to iMovie, or did you find iMovie on your own? A teacher did introduce me to iMovie. Mm -hmm. In fourth grade, I had a teacher with her. She had a film degree. Mm -hmm. So she encouraged making movies in class, and we had free time on Fridays. So she would always encourage me to make movies and showed me the basics of filmmaking so that I could um, expand from there and move on to more advanced things with filmmaking. Mm -hmm. The high school students in this teacher's online courses don't use email as much as he does. What would you suggest to have them start with to communicate? Some of my teachers use the Remind app to mm -hmm. communicate with students, um, and others use Google Classroom, so we can write to our teachers there. Mm -hmm. Are you currently doing any film projects? I'm actually working on organizing and hosting a film festival at the school. Mm which is something that I've always wanted to do. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm working closely with the principal, organizing the event, which we'll be having in April. Terrific. Thank you. OK, I think those are all the questions. Again, thank you so much, Sydney, for presenting today. Thank you. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will mention our upcoming shows. 
That was just wonderful, Sydney. We all have a lot of things now that we can go explore. And it's great to hear it from the student perspective to see how you've found uh, ways to make it really useful for you. Um, we do have some great shows coming up. We have a few that are not yet scheduled or confirmed. But next week, Sam Glicksman is going to be with us. He's just published a brand new book on um, media for learning. And he's going to be sharing some of his great tips about creating media for learning by students as well as teachers. And then we're going to have an uh, open mic show on February 27th, and we haven't yet decided what the topic will be, but I know it will be something that all of you will want to participate in and contribute to. On March 5th, Eric Kurtz is going to join us, and he's done some amazing things with Google Apps and comic strips. And I have no idea exactly what he's going to share, but I know it will be Google awesomeness. Then on March 12th, Brad Spearson is going to join us from a new program called Participate. Um, it's actually Participate Learning um, on the link. And I know that you're going to be interested in learning how you could use that tool with students in your classrooms. And you can see there, March 26th is when we're going to have Another update on Remind. So many new things have been added to that tool. And Jordan Petraza and a, a group of teachers are going to come and share how they're using it in their schools. So go ahead and wrap us up, Lori. All right, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve's, Steve Hargadon's latest He's gathered together all of his PD resources in one place. He also has included the Host Your Own Webinar series. You can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room. And as long as you make your session public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this website. Um, each month, we try to have a featured teacher for the month. There's also the resource in the Live Binder. In addition, in the Live Binder is the link for the survey that you ought to get to when you log out of the session. The link is also in the chat box. Again, the link is in the, the Live Binder as well. When you complete the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. It will print out with your name now. And uh, please use a personal email address instead of a school email address, because schools tend to block this from getting to you. The video and audio collections are also available at iTunes U, besides the recordings uh, on the Classroom 2.0 Live site. You can get the full recording or as an RSS feed as well to get to the archives. Special thanks again to Sydney Sharon, our special guest, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thank you so much for coming.